over 4.5 million barrels of cement, a raging river, and a race against time. The Hoover Dam was more than concrete and steel, it was a test of human will and raw material strength. Step 1. Quarrying the Ingredients – Limestone and Clay To build something as monumental as the Hoover Dam, the first step was gathering the right raw materials. Cement, specifically Portland cement, starts with two critical ingredients – limestone and clay. For this project, engineers relied heavily on the Arizona Portland Cement Company's quarry, located in Clarkdale, Arizona, about 300 miles away from the dam site. This was no small task. Crews worked around the clock, drilling and blasting through rugged terrain to extract millions of tons of limestone and shale. Once the rock was broken down, it was crushed on site into smaller pieces suitable for transport. Each train car was loaded with approximately 70 tons of crushed stone, and trains often carried up to 35 carloads per day to keep up with demand. Over the entire project, more than 1.5 million tons of raw material were moved. But it wasn't just about volume, it was about precision. Every shipment of crushed rock underwent rigorous testing in on-site labs to ensure the chemical makeup was exactly right. Calcium carbonate, silica, alumina, and iron oxide all had to be in perfect balance. Even a slight deviation could compromise the entire structure. Step 2. The Kilns – Turning Rock into Clinker Once the raw materials arrived at the cement plant, the real transformation began. The crushed limestone and clay were first ground down to a fine powder, but turning that powder into cement required firepower. The mixture was fed into enormous rotary kilns, which were long, cylindrical steel tubes stretching up to 400 feet in length and 15 feet in diameter. As the kilns rotated slowly, the material inside was heated to around 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit, or roughly 1,480 degrees Celsius. At these blistering temperatures, a remarkable chemical reaction occurred, fusing the raw materials into marble-sized pellets known as clinker. These clinkers were the building blocks of true Portland cement. At full capacity, the kilns produced more than 2,500 barrels of cement per day, an astonishing output that kept the project on schedule. After cooling, the clinker was sent through grinding mills where it was crushed once more and combined with a small amount of gypsum around 5% by weight. This final touch was crucial because it controlled how quickly the cement would set when mixed with water. What came out of the process was the fine gray powder we recognize as cement, ready to be used in one of the biggest construction projects the world had ever seen. Here's a question for you. Do you know how long it would have taken for the dam's concrete to cool naturally if they hadn't used a special cooling system? Tell your guesses in comments. We'll reveal the answer at the end. And if you love epic engineering stories, hit that subscribe button now. Step 3. How Cement Got to the Dam Producing cement was only half the battle. Getting it from the plant to the dam was a whole different challenge, and engineers had to think creatively to overcome it. Trucks and trains could only do so much, especially given the remote and rugged location of the Hoover Dam site. To solve the problem, the team built a custom aerial cableway system that was nothing short of revolutionary. Massive steel buckets carried barrels of cement, each weighing about 376 pounds across the deep Colorado River Canyon to the heart of the dam site. These buckets moved along high wires that spanned the canyon, delivering cement with incredible speed and precision. At the peak of construction, 16 cableways operated around the clock, keeping the flow of cement constant and efficient. The pace was relentless, Workers were able to pour up to 8,000 cubic yards of concrete in just 24 hours. A record-breaking rate at the time, timing was everything. Once cement is mixed with water, the chemical reaction begins immediately, so there is no room for delay. This aerial cableway system kept everything moving seamlessly, allowing the dam to rise higher and faster than anyone had thought possible. Step 4. Beating the Heat one of the most mind-blowing challenges the engineers faced was managing the heat generated by the curing concrete. Here's the thing. Concrete generates a significant amount of heat as it hardens, a process called the heat of hydration. If the Hoover Dam had been poured as a single solid block, 
it would have taken an estimated 125 years to cool naturally. Not only that, but the intense heat buildup would have caused the concrete to crack and fail long before it ever became operational. To tackle this, engineers devised a brilliant plan. Instead of pouring the dam in one giant piece, they divided it into a series of interlocking concrete blocks, each about 50 feet square and 5 feet high. But even that wasn't enough to manage the heat. They also embedded over 582 miles of 1-inch steel cooling pipes within the concrete. After each block was poured, chilled river water, kept at around 45 degrees Fahrenheit, was pumped through the pipes. This pulled excess heat from the concrete, allowing it to cool and cure evenly in just weeks rather than decades. The cooling system was a groundbreaking innovation, one of the first of its kind on such a massive scale. Thanks to this clever engineering, the Hoover Dam's concrete remains crack-free and rock-solid nearly 90 years later. Step 5. The Perfect Recipe for Concrete Mix So, what exactly made this concrete so legendary? The recipe was deceptively simple but precisely calculated. The mix contained roughly 40% sand, 50% gravel, crushed rock, and 10% Portland cement powder. But the real secret lay in the size of the aggregate. Engineers used extra-large stones, some measuring up to 9 inches across, to reduce the amount of cement needed per cubic yard. This not only kept the mix strong, but also helped minimize the heat produced during curing. By the end of construction, the Hoover Dam had consumed a staggering 4.36 million cubic yards of concrete, more than 5 million barrels of cement, and approximately 10 million tons of total material. To put it into perspective, the amount of concrete used could have paved a four-foot-wide sidewalk circling the entire Earth, an astonishing symbol of the project's sheer scale. But even more remarkable than the volume is the dam's durability. Nearly a century later, thanks to its meticulously engineered mix and groundbreaking cooling system, the Hoover Dam stands as one of the toughest and most enduring feats of construction in human history. Cement has ancient roots dating back to the Romans, who mixed volcanic ash and lime to build enduring marvels like the Pantheon. But modern Portland cement, the type used for the Hoover Dam, was invented in 1824 by Joseph Aspton in England. By the early 20th century, it had become essential to global infrastructure, with U.S. companies like Lehigh Portland Cement and Atlas Cement dominating the market. When the Hoover Dam was greenlit by the Boulder Canyon Project Act of 1928, it posed an unprecedented challenge, producing and delivering over 4.5 million barrels of cement, enough to build a two-lane highway from New York to San Francisco. The Arizona Portland Cement Company became a key supplier, and new rail lines and storage silos were built to keep up with the relentless pace of construction. Today, global cement giants like Lafarge Holcim and Cemex continue to build on these foundations, pushing the limits of what's possible in modern construction. So, remember that trivia question from earlier? Do you know how long it would have taken for the dam's concrete to cool naturally if they hadn't used a special cooling system? The answer is, if the Hoover Dam's concrete hadn't been cooled with its ingenious pipe system, it would have taken a jaw-dropping 125 years to cool naturally. That's the power of smart engineering. Next time you see the Hoover Dam, know you're looking at a masterclass in material science, precision planning, and pure human determination. The cement that built the Hoover Dam wasn't just mixed, it was engineered to perfection. You just finished an intense workout, and now it's time for that protein shake. You scoop some powder into your shaker, mix it up, and take a sip. Smooth, creamy, and packed with muscle-building goodness. But have you ever wondered how that powder was made? It all starts from an unexpected source, and step five might just change how you look at whey protein powder. Inside giant factories, liquid whey is quickly turned into the protein powder millions rely on. Huge steel tanks, powerful filters, and towering dryers work non-stop to get the job done. But speed is everything. Any delay and the protein loses its quality. But here's something crazy. Whey protein is actually a byproduct of cheese making. It's extracted from milk in a way you'd never expect. Keep watching to see what happens inside these factories. And don't forget to guess how many pounds of whey protein do you think the world produces each year? We'll reveal the answer at the end. 
let's jump in and kickstart this healthy journey. If you find it helpful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Step 1. Milking Every whey protein powder starts with one key ingredient, milk. But this isn't just any milk. Factories source fresh, high-quality milk from dairy farms in the US, Europe, and New Zealand, ensuring top purity and nutrition. Dairy cows are fed nutrient-rich diets, and the milk undergoes strict quality testing before processing. Milk is rich in proteins, fats, and lactose, but whey makes up only 20% of its total protein. The rest is casein. To extract whey, the milk must first transform into cheese. The milk undergoes pasteurization at 161 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 seconds to eliminate harmful bacteria while preserving nutrients. Then it's sent into massive stainless steel cheese making vats, each capable of holding thousands of gallons of milk at a time. Step 2. Separation During cheese making, milk is mixed with enzymes like rennet or acid such as citric acid, causing it to split into two parts. Solid curds, rich in casein protein, form the base of cheese, while liquid whey, containing about 20% of milk's protein along with lactose, vitamins, and minerals, was once discarded as waste. For years, dairies dumped thousands of gallons into rivers or used it as animal feed, unaware of its potential. Today, it has become a billion-dollar industry, fueling athletes, bodybuilders, and health-conscious consumers worldwide. But raw whey isn't ready for use. It's about 94% water and still contains fats and sugars, making it unsuitable in its natural state. Before it can become the high-quality supplement found on store shelves, it must go through advanced filtration techniques to isolate pure protein. Once separated, the concentrated liquid is sent to massive stainless steel spray dryers, operating at temperatures around 160 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, where it transforms into the fine powder used in supplements. What was once discarded now fuels strength, proving that science can turn waste into gold. Pretty innovative, right? Step 3. Filtration Once separated from the curds, raw whey is far from the pure protein powder found on supplement shelves. It still contains unwanted fats, carbohydrates, and lactose, which must be removed. To achieve this, factories use advanced filtration techniques to isolate the protein. One method, microfiltration and ultrafiltration relies on ultrafine filters with microscopic pores that allow small protein molecules to pass through while trapping larger fat and sugar molecules. This process is purely mechanical, meaning no chemicals are used, preserving the protein's natural structure. Multiple rounds of filtration ensure maximum purity, increasing protein concentration while keeping essential amino acids intact. Another approach Ion exchange uses electrical charges to attract and extract protein molecules, leaving everything else behind. By the end of this process, the liquid whey is significantly more concentrated, often reaching up to 90% protein content. But it's still in liquid form, and the journey isn't over yet. The next step is where the real transformation happens, turning this protein-rich liquid into the fine, scoopable powder that fuels millions of athletes worldwide. Step 4. Spray Drying Now, it's time for the key step to take the spotlight, turning liquid whey into the fine, scoopable powder found in protein tubs worldwide. To do this, factories rely on massive spray drying towers, some as tall as multi-story buildings. First, the concentrated whey protein is pumped to the top of a giant drying chamber and sprayed out in an ultra-fine mist. At the same time, a powerful blast of superheated air, reaching 350 degrees Fahrenheit, races through the chamber. In an instant, the moisture evaporates, leaving behind tiny, dry protein particles. These particles drift downward, collecting at the base, where they're gathered for further processing. The result? A pure, lightweight protein powder, ready to be blended, packaged, and shipped worldwide. But what about those chocolate, vanilla, or cookies and cream flavors? That's where the most awaited step comes in. Step 5. Flavoring Before whey protein reaches store shelves, it undergoes one final transformation, flavoring and blending. 
This is where brands turn plain protein into tasty, mixable shakes people love. To achieve the perfect taste and texture, several key ingredients are added. Natural and artificial flavors like vanilla, chocolate, and cookies and cream create variety, while sweeteners such as sugar, sucralose, or stevia enhance sweetness without adding those excess calories. Thickening agents like xanthan gum improve consistency, making shakes smooth and creamy. Some brands take a step further, adding vitamins, minerals, probiotics, or digestive enzymes to improve absorption and overall benefits. Blending isn't as simple as tossing everything together. High-speed industrial mixers ensure even distribution, so every scoop delivers the same taste and nutrition. The powder is then ready to move to the packaging line. But before it's sealed, it must pass rigorous quality tests for protein content, purity, and safety. Labs check for contaminants, like heavy metals and bacteria, ensuring the final product meets strict health standards. And here's a fun fact. Some premium protein powders use cold-pressed or cross-flow microfiltration processing, which helps preserve more amino acids and improves mixability. Step 6. Quality Testing Before a single tub or bag of whey protein reaches store shelves, it must pass quality control tests to ensure purity, safety, and effectiveness. Factories run detailed lab analysis to verify protein content ensuring that every scoop delivers the precise amount listed on the label. They also test for contaminants like harmful bacteria, heavy metals, and additives, meeting strict international food safety standards. Protein powders are also tested to ensure they dissolve smoothly in water or milk, preventing clumps that can ruin a shake. Once approved, the protein is packaged in airtight tubs or resealable bags to keep it fresh. Some brands take it a step further, using nitrogen flushing to remove oxygen, preventing oxidation and extending shelf life. This process ensures that the protein maintains its potency and freshness for up to two years. With packaging complete, the protein is now ready for its final journey, reaching the fitness enthusiasts around the world. How many of you are fitness freaks? Let us know in the comments below. Step 7. Shipping with quality approved and packaging sealed, the protein powder embarks on its global journey. From massive warehouses holding millions of pounds, shipments head to gyms, supplement stores, and online retailers across 100 plus countries, including the US, Canada, Germany, India, and Australia. Some of the world's biggest brands ship thousands of tubs daily, ensuring a steady supply for athletes, bodybuilders, and fitness enthusiasts. But maintaining peak quality isn't easy. Airtight, moisture-proof packaging locks in freshness, while temperature-controlled storage prevents clumping and nutrient loss. So, the next time you scoop your protein, don't forget that it has traveled thousands of miles, passed multiple filtration processes, and been transformed from a simple cheese byproduct into a billion-dollar fitness essential. Now all that's left is for you to mix it, shake it up, and power your body with pure whey protein. From fresh milk on dairy farms to the fine powder in your shaker, whey protein undergoes an incredible journey of transformation. Advanced filtration, high-speed spray drying, and precise flavoring techniques ensure you get the best quality protein in every scoop. And now, for the answer to your earlier question, how many pounds of whey protein does the world produce each year? A staggering 4 billion pounds! That's enough protein to fuel athletes for years to come. Now, here's the real question. What's your favorite protein flavor? Chocolate? Vanilla? Cookies and cream? Drop your answer in the comments. And if you found this process fascinating, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more behind-the-scenes looks at how your favorite power-packed products are made.